Um, Ken. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a few years on town now. <laughs> 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 Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families, and I do also want to formally thank you for the uh, birthday greetings, and Teresa, thank you very much for for being here. It's wonderful. Look forward to, to tasting. <laughs> so, what does bring us here, though, in a more formal sense, is is you asked us to testify related to Woodside. Um, I do want to point out that Christine Johnson, Deputy Commissioner for Family Service Division, is also here and may need to help me out here, particularly in responding to your questions. But the, 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 again, the particular impetus was, as we've been talking about a proposal to close Woodside, we've talked about the request for proposals that we had issued and that we were looking forward to the responses to uh, geared towards expanding our system of care. Uh, and the idea, I know, was to try to give you some, uh, some uh, a, a description of what we had received by way of responses, because we did receive those uh, on February 28th, to help you in your decision-making process. So the, the, um, the, the, as you may know from the uh, media, we did receive four responses um, from Beckett Family Services uh, from Oxford, New Hampshire, the Foundation's Behavioral Health Organization from Doylestown, Pennsylvania, from Grafton Integrated Health from Winchester, Virginia, and from the Institute of Professional Practice from Berlin, Vermont. Uh, the idea, just to be clear, even though the, several of those are out-of-state organizations, just to remind you, the idea is to have um, programs, facilities in Vermont. So the fact that they are outside, out-of-state, the proposals are to do something here. The, the, the reality here is, though, I appreciate uh, um, the desire, I really wanted to come forward with as much information as I could. The, the, the short answer, though, is these are interesting proposals. We're not ready to make any decisions. We recognize that we need to be careful and thoughtful about this. Um, as you may recall, we asked for both proposals related to our short-term stabilization needs and our long-term needs. We are looking pretty carefully at these responses. Uh, candidly, those are familiar with the procurement process. There is a process where you can um, follow up um, the initial responses with questions. We have recognized that we need to do that. So what that means is that we're not quite ready. And I know that's hard for you, and I, I'm, I'm going to be straightforward about that. I, I'm dis obviously disappointed in that I had hoped we would have a really clear, solid um, response that I could talk to you about today. Honestly, I don't. I'm, I'm saying this to you, though, in, in um, you know, being straightforward, that I do think it's worthwhile thinking through and making sure we get answers to questions. And I say that also in the context of we continue to be doing well in terms of our existing system, managing our population well. By that, I mean the population at Woodside remains at three. It's the same three that we have not had a new admission in weeks. <coughs> which I think is consistent with the trends we talked about earlier in terms of a uh, reduced level of um, youth delinquency, a reduced level of youth violence, and also that our existing expanded system of care is doing uh, well in terms of managing those youth who do need um, supervision and care and treatment in residential <coughs> programs. So the, the, the bottom line is that, and I will, I, I have to say, because I did hear your introduction, um, Representative Pugh, um, COVID-19 is also a factor for us. We are very, uh, we, uh, Christine and her staff, uh, I will admit, I was on vacation, but last week put a lot of attention into thinking through, working with our partners about how to address the COVID-19 issue. I'm not going to take too much time now, but I do want you to know that's a, an, an important priority for us for fairly obvious reasons in terms and of I, our I children in care. And committee, that will be, um, I, I'd ask that we not go down that question this morning. That will be part of the hearing um, at 4 o'clock um, this afternoon. And I do appreciate that. I do. Um, I just. I sort of yeah. want to let you know, though, that with that in mind, it's it's obviously important, and, and um, we're definitely focusing a lot of attention on it. So, so the, the the reality is, this isn't a long presentation because I don't have much new to tell you. Time frame is uh, we have a um, uh, an obligation under RFP to respond to folks uh, by March 16th. 
I think is that correct? Christine? Thank you. And, and so it's not very long. Um, and so we, we look forward within you know the next um, uh, uh, ten days to two weeks to being able to give you a more. Um, descriptive response. And, and again, I, I do feel bad that I'm not able to give you more information, but again, I think it does make sense for us to be careful in this process and not prematurely either make decisions or uh, uh, get outside of the procurement process, which I've been constantly reminded by um, our lawyers that I have to be careful about. Um, so with that, I think that I'm glad to do my best to answer any questions, but, but the short um, summary here is um, I do think we're doing well in terms of um, caring for and managing the population of youth that come into our care and uh, we just need a little bit more time with respect to clarifying where we are with respect to the responses to the request for proposals. Anything? Ms. Christine, you no, I think ahead? Christine Johnson, um, Deputy Commissioner, the only thing that I would add is that two of the three youth that are there are in the custody of the Department of Corrections, and so we continue to have one young person there from the Family Services Division. Um, can you just clarify for us? You keep saying, I cannot <laughs> because of the <clears throat> procurement process. Is there a legal or is this an administrative decision? And if it is an administrative decision, what do we need to do to partner with you so that on March 16th you don't come with something that um, is totally unknown to us? So I think there's um, the, the I, my understanding is a combination of both that uh, we have some legal obligations to uh, not get out ahead of the procurement process in terms of disclosing portions of the information. Um, the, uh, the, but it is also in part a judgment call on our part that uh, we want to be providing information to you that we've also had a chance to think about and to provide context. Um, in terms of what we have, what our questions are, but even, and again, I'm hesitating a little bit because I, I'll be straight, straightforward again, in light of the fact that we anticipate asking questions of some of the respondents, there actually may be more legal impediments, but I think that um, I do appreciate your question, I appreciate your desire to want to know what we have. <coughs> I'm asking um, for you to wait seven to ten days to, uh, for us to go through this process and then provide you with the information. And so are you, is it, is it the department who is providing appropriations with um, potential language <coughs> right now? Language about um, what to do with um, youth, let's say the two youth who are um, in Woodside right now i.e. youth who have been in Woodside but who are in correction, who are in the custody of corrections. <coughs> Language has been proposed. Is that from you all? Language has been proposed, um, has been given to appropriations for them to consider around closure. Mm -hmm. And so is that language from you? So you, uh, yes, as part of the budget bill. Uh, yes. It isn't specific, just to be clear, is at least to my understanding, to um, Department of Corrections or anything else. It is the language that is proposed by the administration as part of the budget refers to the proposed closing of Woodside. I'm not sure if I've answered your question correctly. Well, I but. mean, and, um, it's a little, I, I'd be very, I understand the position that you are in and I, um, the budget is not separate from policy. And um, you are now saying, um, I can't give you any information. I can't even tell you anything about the programmatic aspects or whatever else. So we're just going to keep going on along with closing Woodside. And um, uh, I hope you understand, um, I think, our collective um, view is that may be the right thing to do can't do it now. 
I appreciate that, and obviously I also respect your decision process. I have an alternative that I can suggest, if you, which is actually came in part from the Senate, which as you know is also looking at this. Right. Um, and so one of the ideas that's been proposed uh, by the Senate Judiciary Committee is that to um, consider the idea of recommending, consistent with the administration's proposal, closure, but contingent on the, the um, DCF or the Agency of Human Services, however you want to frame it, coming forward with uh, more clarity, whether you call it a plan or identification of spe more specific approaches to making sure that we have an appropriate array of services and programs to meet the needs both for kids in DCF custody and for uh, youth under uh, 18 in the custody of the Department of Corrections. So again, I am mindful of the point, I mean, and I'm very respectful of it. Um, the reality is we do think it's the right thing to do, to propose to close Woodside. We are actually uh, reasonably confident that we, under our current system of care, can do well. But again, as I've said to you before, I want to expand um, our capacity to make sure we're all comfortable. And so I know I need to do that um, as quickly as possible. Candidly, um, the RFP process was delayed. I wish it hadn't been, uh, but that's where I am now. So honestly, I am trying to do the best I can under those circumstances, I want to be straightforward with you, but that's my thought, is I get your hesitation, obviously you have to make your decision, and, and, and uh, um, that's appropriate, of course. The, the idea of holding, uh, if you will, my feet to the fire in terms of getting you more information is obviously legitimate and appropriate also. Yeah, I mean, it, it really jumps off of yours, which is the concern, you know, uh, there are a lot of moving pieces and things are moving ahead with that location and site and future plans. And I'm wondering if you think it's realistic by July 1st, when Woodside, you know, when your aim would be to have it closed, um, to have a place, uh, like a, a therapeutic, you know, we, we've talked about a number of different types of spaces that need to be created, therapeutic, you know, short-term stabilization, uh, a place of last resort, like that, that's the biggest concern, it's just, do you feel like that's even possible, and yeah, a, as a policy group, I think we, we want to be able to, you know, weigh into that, so. So, yeah, so the answer is you are correct on all of those things. We want all of those. My point is, continues to be, actually, we already have all of those. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is we want to expand them mm -hmm. to, to make sure that we have um, the appropriate placements, even for those youth, to be very specific, um, who need because I do think the potential gap that we're dealing with, I think what is really the elephant in the room, is the issue of a youth who is allegedly commits some really violent act, who we don't know, we don't know what to do with, where do we place that youth right. while we do learn more? So again, That's I, the, being straightforward, right, right, that right. Is, is the angst that I'm going through too. Yep. Um, I have, And so we're working through, we do have some interesting proposals where we need to figure out um, is how to proceed, how to move forward. We have some a set of great service providers now, too. Let me make that point very clearly. We do appreciate that. So, the, But the short answer is yes, I am reasonably confident because, again, when I look, when I look at um, the, 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 the history and including recent history, the fact, as, as uh, Christine pointed out, we only have one DCF kid um, who's just waiting a placement. Um, and obviously, that's part of the issue is if, if Woodside isn't there, it's get specific. How would we deal with that circumstance, right? right? We need right. to deal with that. Right. DOC is definitely a little bit of an interesting um, aspect of this, and we're working very closely with DOC. Um, historically, as we've discussed before, they've only had a few kids um, who have actually been at Woodside. It happens that they have two right now, so we do have to work with them, too, and our array of um, providers, both new and existing to make sure that we can do as well as possible for them. Because again, there is an alternative for them, but it's not a desired alternative in terms of using existing correctional facilities, but with sight and sound separation. So there is an alternative for that population, to be clear. Um, so, but again, we want to come up with a better approach. Just one follow-up, like if, 
for example, it becomes clear that July 1st is too soon to put all this together. I mean, you're open to extending that, I, I would assume. So again, I have to you know, be, the, the caveat is, if I don't feel that we're ready, you can be sure I will say so. Okay. Um, we need to work through, I need to work through the administration. It is a complicated budget process to be sure, but please know that if I don't feel like we were ready, we are ready, I will say so. Um, I apologize for looking like I was a teenager and being on my phone. I have forwarded, um, of course it's not coming, um, the, the um, language that we were, that I got sent from appropriations around this, the, the um, youth who are in the custody of corrections who, I want to say the, the two kids, <laughs> yeah. um, the, the two kids who were there as well so that people can look at that and you can see that I, as no, well. I don't think I have seen that. Okay, so so, again, and honestly, I was on vacation, so I, I want to own that I haven't completely caught up to all my emails. But um, I, I appreciate you sending it to me. Um, Commissioner, um, what has, um, not been said by someone on the record has been said in the hallways a bunch, which is that yes, there are no new admissions, but guess what? Who's in charge of the admissions? It is um, DCF, and what is being suggested by some is that um, there is a concerted effort and a plan, that since it is your plan since it is, is the administration's um, proposal to close Woodside, that in fact um, you are sending more, more youth out of state, that you are saying more youth don't um, uh, require residential treatment, and that you, that, um, that you, not you personally, the department is, um, if, I, if I recall, a judge can, uh, what you told us is um, a judge can say a youth needs to um, be in Woodside and you can um, overturn the, overrule the judge. The department can overrule the judge and in fact that's what um, is being done. And so the long and short of that is there is, you know, there is some conversation that, that we are being told um, that there is a concerted effort to create a false narrative. I actually really appreciate you putting that out there so I can respond to it, so thank you. Uh, that's the, my job. <laughs> the reality is I actually am very proud of our approach to making sure that we care for youth in the least restrictive alternative consistent with their needs and the safety needs of the monitors. That from my perspective, that isn't new. I've been commissioner for five years. That has been one of the principles that I have worked with our staff to look at what youth really need to be locked into a facility that is a juvenile correctional facility. Those of you who've been there know it looks and feels like a jail. We know from research that that has um, significant negative impacts on youth. We know that there's a stigma attached to youth who've been at Woodside. I have always taken the position that we need to use Woodside for those youth who really need to be in that environment for security's sake, for treatment's sake. On the other hand, if a youth can be safely um, cared for in less restrictive alternatives, I want us to do that. In, if, if you recall some of the data we provided you in the past, in the five years since I've been commissioner, the trend has consistently gone down. It's not new. Um, when I started here, the, the population of Woodside averaged approximately 20 um, youth per day. That went gradually down year by year. Admitted, it was a 10 last year. Admittedly, it really went substantially down in the last 10 months. The, you actually shared with us the approach two years ago to change how youth got to Woodside. It used to be that 
uh, state's attorneys and judges could make the decision to place a youth at Woodside regardless of a DCF recommendation. Even though they then put the youth in DCF custody, we were not free to make decisions about where the appropriate placement for that youth was. Working with you, we changed the law two years ago. And so to be clear, we don't overrule a judge. But what you did was change the law so that if a youth is accused of a delinquent act, the question about where that youth, if the youth did need to be placed out of the home, it's a DCF recommendation. If DCF recommends that the youth be placed in Woodside, the judge has the authority to accept that or reject it. The judge could say, no, this youth doesn't need that level of security or supervision. So DCF, you can't put the youth in Woodside. Find another placement. On the other hand, if DCF recommends that the youth be placed in a community-based residential setting, the judge doesn't have the authority to overrule us. Because in effect, the thinking, and some of you will remember this from the conversation two years ago, if the youth is putting, uh, if the court is putting the youth in my custody, then shouldn't I have um, a level of authority to make a decision about what's safe and what's not? And so when that law passed, it did change the dynamic. There's no question about it. That then DCF does make the preliminary decision or recommendation regarding placement under those circumstances. I think that's a good thing. Um, it allows for our staff to use their professional judgment and expertise to make a decision about what's the appropriate least restrictive placement. That's what we've done. Consistent with that, again, I apologize for going over some things um, that we've talked about before, but I do want to give a, a, a full response. That's why in the last two years we expanded our system of care. And we've talked about the expansion that we've made to the Vermont School for Girls the expansion to um, uh, Seal at Depot Street, the expansion we've made with Washington County Mental Health, the expansion we made with Beckett to expand our um, assessment and stabilization beds in various places around the state. All of those were consistent with what we believe and understood to be the state approach of caring for youth in the least restrictive environment. So from my perspective, it's, it's not um, a conspiracy. It's not, um, frankly, putting it more positively, it is a straightforward approach that actually we're proud of. Um, the reality is that the more recent change in the, in the last eight to 10 months has actually been the youth. Um, honestly, as we've showed you the data, the number of kids coming into custody, the number of court filings related to delinquency is all markedly down, which is a very positive statement. Um, and so all of that is involved in um, reviewing this. And again, understand that I did make a proposal. We did analyze this a year ago. At that time, when we were looking at and ed basically every day having 10 or more kids at Woodside, my view was our community-based system could not manage that expansion. When that reduced to under five, that changed my opinion. And, and my point is, that is what drove it. It's the, it's the kids who um, are actually doing well in our communities. And, and honestly, it's not to say we don't bear some uh, legitimate credit for that, including when I say we, you. You have helped support many programs in our communities to support families, to support young people that I think have helped this trend. So again, part of this is, is very much a good news story that we simply are seeing less need for a uh, for uh, numbers of youth to be in secure setting. So that's what's driven it. I, and I hope I've answered your question, but I don't, I, I'm, I'm glad to sort of follow up if I've missed something. But again, from my perspective, we're proud, and I think as a community, we can be proud of the reduced number of youth who need to be in um, a secure settings. We have a question. Oh. Um, Did you want to say something? I just, I think the piece that I wanted to add is to not lose that. Part of your question was, are there more kids out of state than in state? And that is not true. There are fewer kids out of state than there are in state. And I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that 16 of the, I think, 42 kids that are out of state 
today are because they are on the autism spectrum and we do not have a facility in the state of Vermont to meet their needs. So yes, we have kids out of state. Yes, that is part of our system of care, but it is not, we are not sending kids out of state instead of serving them in state. And I, I continue to say that my mantra is I want kids in families, and when they can't be in families, I want them with extended kin, fictive kin, and if they have to go to residential placement, we absolutely want them as close to their communities as possible. That is not always feasible, and so yes, we do use out-of-state placements, and often they are close by. Sometimes they're not. They're in Florida or um, Tennessee, but we, but it's, I think it's part of the narrative is that we're doing this intentionally. We're sending kids out-of-state intentionally. That is just not the case. Can I? Um, make sure that the 42 kids are the same number that I'm thinking about. Or that, um, is this 42 kids? So um, we did, the 42 come from, come the, from the that list. times. The, I mean, the point in time, but does that include, because I forget, I don't have that in front of me. Does that include the um, individuals who uh, maybe Department of Mental Health has sent out, out um, um, and does that include um, who might, in fact, you know, it, the, the no wrong, shall I say, the no wrong door entry kinds of things. So we have education and we have um, um, mental health. So the answer is no. The, the data we provided you are the children in DCF custody. Um, it is accurate, as you're pointing out, that the Department of Mental Health and, and the Agency of Education do place youth um, in both in-state and out-of-state programs, and that is separate. We do work together, let me be clear. Um, we and, do talk and, together. And your proposal and your RFP does, in fact, yeah. reflect that. And so I think for us to make a full understanding mm -hmm. is we need to know who all is out-of-state under those criteria. We're glad to provide it. The Department of Mental Health actually just produced a report last week, if I'm not mistaken, again, trying to keep up to my email, that does actually break out that information um, in significant detail. So we can work on getting you that information. Thank you. I'm sorry, I, interrupted. I jumped ahead of um, Teresa. You're the chair. <laughs> um, so um, I, I appreciate the explanation that you just provided. Um, one of the one of the things that um, is concerning to me is the um, let me try to rephrase this as a question. So, um, in testimony before the break, we had testimony from a number of um, providers that DCF currently contracts with, um, and all of them, I believe, said that they have in the past relied on Woodside as that sort of place of last resort when. Um, you know, uh, a youth was just kind of like off the wall and destroying stuff and hurting themselves and other people and needed a, a um, short term, usually, um, although I think one place said that they actually had to say, I'm sorry, we can't take the person back. Um, and then I just heard you say, uh, so they all said that they needed that. Um, and I heard you say that you're reasonably confident that's not confident enough for me. Um, and and then I see language proposed. Well, I don't know who's proposed. I don't, uh, I don't, you know, I don't no, know who's I don't proposed know. it. Yeah. I, this was, this was so now, right, so now that I've seen this, I can tell you this is not our proposal. Okay. Yeah. And I do want to review this and, and work with the Department of Corrections and the agency to uh, respond. And I don't know no. if it's the, I mean, I, I don't know if it's DOC language or. Right, I, I, I don't, I, I, you know. I, I think this is coming from the committee. Oh, oh, okay. Well, in any event, it's not good language, but um, whatever. <laughs> okay, no longer yeah, joint corrections oversight committee. Um, so I guess my question is, and then you talked about a trend, you know, the trend is, and, uh, you know, honestly, one year doesn't make a trend. Um, and so I'm, I'm struggling with the concept of, because uh, we don't know the responses, so we don't know to the extent um, to which any of the four responses are able to be that provider of last resort. Um, and I think that it, it is a, a good place that we're in in terms of having developed uh, more community capacity. You know, it would be disturbing if we saw these numbers increasing um, because we put a significant amount of resources into trying to not have that happen. Um, 
but I, I just had nothing, unfortunately, today that you said has convinced me that we don't need some sort of place of last resort that, um, and I don't know whether or not any one of the proposals or more of the proposals um, are able to pull that off by July 1st. So let me be candid about something. The phrase provider of last resort, although I appreciate it, as I've come to look at this situation, honestly, I don't look at it that way. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is I think what we've learned over the past particularly two years is that the needs of some of our youth are unique. And sometimes you can categorize them, but they don't always mix. So the point that, that Christine was just mentioning about youth with autism, who may be um, engaging in seriously disruptive behavior, mixing that individual with others with different levels might not work at all. Correct. Mixing girls with, in a facility where the overwhelming numbers of youth are boys may not work. Mm -hmm. Mixing kids, and this is a lot I think of what you heard, I wasn't here all the time, kids with serious mental health issues with other youth who have um, different levels of uh, problems or reasons for their disruptive behavior might not work. So candidly, my view is we need to have a variety of resources. Mm -hmm. So it is, that's when I talk about expanding the system of care, that's what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. And it goes to also, I'm very mindful of the point that any time a youth is in a program, it might not work and it might be temporary, that they just need a bit of a break, or it might be permanent. And yes, that's, again, part of our system that partially already exists. So that the point would be is if a youth is in one program and it's not working and they need at least a few days to figure it out, we need to have, and we do have, capacity already. But honestly, again, I want more. Um, the ability to move that youth to another program, at least on a temporary basis, to assess what's going on with that youth and what should be the next step. That's part of the reason why we have an assessment program now. We did not have that uh, a year and a half ago. Um, the point being is we definitely need to have the capacity to address all of those needs. I don't believe it is one place. And so that's why we're talking about expanding the system of care. Mm -hmm. Sandy. So I, I, I looked at the RFP um, uh, request a while back, but and I recall that it included mental health issues and it included education issues. I don't recall that it included children, uh, uh, minors who have been convicted in the adult system and would otherwise be in prison. So it does not <laughs> specify those youth because, again, that's a legal category. It's not a behavior. Um, it's the behaviors that are still the issue in terms of making a residential placement. The jurisdiction in terms of whether they're under the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections, uh, the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health, or the custody of DCF, or for that matter, their parents, going to the point that Representative Pew made, is not the issue. The issue is the behaviors. So the issue with respect to a youth who's been charged as an adult is, again, being straightforward, is typically they're accused of committing a violent act, right? That's typically why that's going to happen. And so the question is, is there a program uh, that can address those behaviors? It is then a decision that may be made by the Commissioner of Corrections, not necessarily me, about whether or not um, that youth should be in a uh, corrections facility or a um, community-based secure program. So my point to you is I do believe that the um, requests have the potential to be able, uh, or the responses have the potential to be able to address that population. As I think we talked about before, um, we are working with the Department of Corrections. So as I said, to a certain extent, they have to make judgment calls on a case-by-case -case basis because when a youth is put into the commissioner's custody, that is his or her prerogative. Um, what we want to have is, again, the capacity and the relationship to be able to even place that youth in um, the most appropriate um, setting consistent with the court order uh, in that particular case. But that's why it's a little different, because the issue of whose jurisdiction, we didn't, we didn't I don't believe we laid out in the RFP <coughs> Distinctions between whether a youth is in the custody of DCF or mental health or um, in their parents' custody either. So I get your point, but I do want you to know that we are mindful of 
um, the issue of where should, don't we want to have, and the answer is yes, we want to have the capacity to give more choices to the Commissioner of Corrections with respect to youth under 18 who are charged as adults. So does that more discretion mean putting them in a, an adult facility um, separated by whatever sentence? Uh, there's a requirement, again, to clarify that the Commissioner of Corrections does have the authority to place youth charged as adults 16 and 17 of age, years of age, and, and older, of course, in the uh, a corrections facility subject to sight and sound separation from the adults in that facility. That, that is the Commissioner of Corrections authority. What the Commissioner of Corrections has said, I think quite publicly, is he does not see that as the preferred approach. He would much rather continue the approach of working with DCF to find other um, uh, settings to enable that youth, even if they need to be held in a closely supervised setting, but to be with other youth rather than separated um, in a correctional facility. Is it a question for him rather than you <coughs> to um, have a sense of how many um, youth age 17, 16 and 17? Could it be a 15-year-old? So there are youth occasionally charged as 15-year-olds, and the distinction there is that youth is not, even if they're charged as an adult, they are not allowed at all to okay. be in an adult facility. That's a legal issue. Okay. Okay. With respect to 16 and 17 year olds, I think we've provided you some information on the numbers. Okay. They're relatively small. We've seen an average approximately um, six per year. Um, one of the challenges with that population is the adult court system process takes longer. Um, and so one of the challenges we face with respect to working together is those may be kids held um, uh, in, in a holding pattern, if you will, for longer periods of time than youth in my custody, where I have more authority to uh, move forward. I don't have lawyers, so I don't care about that. No, excuse me. Um, where are they held for a longer time? In the sight and sound? These nine youth, but it's so, six. So historically, that's what Woodside has been used for okay, by the Department what, of Corrections. So, Absolutely. And you are trying it based on the <coughs> fact that the RFP does not include this um, population. Um, what's going to happen to those nine kids? So again, I, what I've tried to say is that oh. we call it, call it out, especially in the request okay. for proposals. But we think the issue that we're working on is to identify both in terms of new and existing providers, many of whom could take you through or eight, up to 18. It's, that's not new. Again, if you remember our the information we provided you, that's not a change. The issue is um, where could, which of those programs, new or old, could take on this population um, as directed by the Commissioner of Corrections. And so that discussion is going on um, as we speak. Sorry to That's okay. no. ask a question that's been asked three times by some of us. <laughs> but again, that's, I, I don't mind. I'm glad to try, I'm glad to, try to clarify. This is the language that was sent to me by, by um, um, appropriations for comment. Um, you don't really want my comment. <laughs> uh, well, you, know, um, you know, one, there's, I don't think, I believe the Corrections Oversight Committee has, it has morphed into the Justice. Justice, yes. The Justice Reinforced so we can start with the committee name is wrong. From what you just said, um, it's not youth age 17 and under. It could only be youth 16 and 17. Um, I mean, there's some things that are, I don't know where the, I mean, I have no idea the, the, the genesis. I just know who sent it to me, but I'm not going to paint yeah. that individual with saying that the language came from them. What I found disturbing about this is that this isn't talking about kids in the custody of corrections. This is talking about people in your, your custody. I'm pretty confused by that. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 
Yes. I'll just be straightforward about it. At first, okay. we wouldn't use an adult facility. I think it probably meant Department of Corrections. But honestly, since I didn't write it, I don't know what led to it. I think the idea there in, in subparagraph A should be reading Department of Corrections. It's in the cut because they're not in our custody. The, the, these youth that we're talking about, they're in the custody of corrections. So then, this was really only you're saying that maybe this is the six that you just referred to, and only those six. That's my understanding. Again, I not knowing exactly what yeah, right. led to this, uh, yeah. that would be my interpretation that there was a misunderstanding, mm -hmm. but. Again, the question you posed to me, you know, Representative Haas posed to me, was about youth, as I understood it, youth in the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections, yes. but who are under 18. And I get that, but that's why this is a little confusing to me. And I appreciate, the, again, appreciate the concern, definitely working on it, and I and appreciate your mm -hmm. hesitation. Bye. I'm just wondering if the uh, proposals that you received were um, less or in in terms of the cost, than the current operating costs? So we, to be candid, that's part of the question that we need to clarify. As, as, as some of you who've had experience with these things uh, know, sometimes when people respond, they're not always explicit about costs. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what we're looking at. And would you be able to provide us with that? I'm certainly the, after, yes, okay. absolutely, we, yeah. <clears throat> And, and let me be clear, that's part of, you know, I, I, I have to be mindful of the cost. So it's clearly we want to make sure we have appropriate programs and services, but cost is one of the factors. Um, so if, um, I'm just thinking about that cost thing you just said. So, so if and and if let's just say because this is potential that not able to fully operationalize um, the plan by July first, um, would it? I mean, come on. Would it? <laughs> please let's be real. I'm tr I mean, I am. I'm, I'm trying to modest. allow some flexibility, <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, would. Uh, it, it, it seems apparent, you know, even given everything, that, you know, uh, staffing for a facility at a 30-bed staffing level um, seems like um, that's not necessary. Agreed. Um, and so, um, never mind. <laughs> I just Thank realized you. I can't really ask this question. Now. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it you probably knew where I was going, it, but I it can't really related. ask it. Um, the, the placements that you have now, do you pay, does the state pay only when a child is present? <clears throat> do I we, do really do appreciate we, that do we, question. Do we pay for capacity? So the answer is both. And, and, and when I say we, I'm sort of actually looking at the agency because it's one of those things we're looking at pretty carefully in this model. Uh, because <laughs> right now, again, I don't need to, I don't know that I want to get into this too deeply, but we have a system of payment called, referred to oftentimes as PNMI, private, oh, there you go, it's great, private non-medical institutions. Um, and it's a rate setting mechanism um, that actually is currently housed in DIVA uh, that tries to uh, deal in a, uh, an appropriate manner with the cost of residential care. And they have a very complicated system uh, for doing that. Um, Again, we may have, one of the things that we are look, we're looking at that because we've heard a lot of concerns about it from providers and, and from administrators because sometimes it results in emergency requests for more money that are not budgeted and it's challenging all around. So we're looking. That's the, the exist. That's the basic system. Having said that, there are other systems that um, allow for paying for capacity, so that there is a set amount of money um, provided uh, regardless of whether or not the bed is filled. Um, the Department of Mental Health uses that for its uh, so-called level one facilities. So an acute level of, of uh, inpatient hospitalization for those with the acute mental health levels, that system does provide, um, in effect, guaranteed payment. Um, there are some other alternatives to uh, uh, hospitalization, other programs, that also have a set fee. We actually have um, at least one 
contract now where we are basically paying for capacity. As we go forward, one of the things we're looking at is recognizing um, some of the challenges of some of our populations. And honestly, it's part of the context of being a small state. Um, uh, how do you appropriately um, provide capacity for relatively small numbers? And sometimes that will mean we, are, uh, we will need to pay for capacity and then do the best we can to utilize those beds appropriately. But it also involves then, again, I'm getting into a little bit deeper in terms of how our system works, which you may have heard a little bit about. But it also sometimes means if we have a bed that's really appropriate for very acute needs, needing high supervision, but we don't have any of those youth here, and if we're paying for it, we want to use that bed. But then if the next week a youth comes to our attention who needs that capacity, we have to figure out how to move things around to make it work. So that's part of what we're doing. It's a complicated system. I you know, want to be, uh, make sure you do understand that. And I'm, we're, as we talked about earlier um, in this session, we're glad to go through the level of detail about that system. But it is complicated. I, I want to forewarn you. Can I just circle back to the four um, sure. responses? Um, I am aware that we have a we the state has a relationship with Beckett, and Beckett has facilities here. Yes. Do we have a relationship with any of the other three: the Foundation, the Grafton, and the Institute for Professional Practice? Um, yes, we have a relationship with foundations, which uh, does run um, a residential program in Pennsylvania. We do utilize that; it's in our list of um, placements. So, okay. yes, we have experience with them. I don't believe I'm looking to Christine for help here. Uh, I, I don't believe that she's confirming. We don't have relationships with the other two. And um, is it fair to ask, you can tell me I can't, um, how many of these are for profit? I, it's fair to ask. I don't know the answer, though. And I don't know if Christine does. I know at least one of them is, and, but I'm forgetting if two of them are. But I do know that one of the four is a profit. For profit. Are we get back to you know who that is, or do I have to go on the internet? <laughs> Uh, no, I, can, we can get I believe Foundations is for profit. Is that right? Do you know? F foundations may be UHC. Foundations may be. We'll be glad to get back to um, you. We need to be on the floor at 10. Um, are there any other questions right now? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Someone might want to take a picture of yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say, did you, could you send, is it possible for you to email that to someone? It's on our account. Oh, oh, oh thank yeah. you. Great. Okay. Yeah. Great. Sorry. Yeah. Great. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Great. And I will also touch base with House Appropriations. And um, uh, just yeah. so you know, I, I appreciate you um, well, pointing you know, that it's, out. It, 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 it's, it's our job as a committee to put things out there so that people can respond. And um, I just want to be clear that I'm not sure even the fact whether this was a real proposal. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I got this from appropriations, from a member of appropriations as what do you think? And I don't know where it came, whether, you know, so I don't want anyone to, to um, grab onto this as this is the best thing since sliced bread or who the, who, <laughs> or where did this come from and it seems a little odd. Um, you know. Should, should we try and look at the language that um, the commissioner mentioned um, from the Senate that they might be working on something? Um, yes, and I'm going to um, perhaps um, um, ask Sandy and Mary Beth, um, um, Mary Beth, because you um, have done a lot of stuff in terms of corrections and because you're on correct, uh, <laughs> Justice Oversight Committee to check in with or try to discover what that is, unless you happen to have it. <laughs> uh, it, it was really I'm sorry, not you, Christine. You've been on vacation. <laughs> we don't have anything formal. It, okay. it, they were more informal okay. communications. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's um, where we are. Um, we'll be flexible today. 
Um, I need to be somewhere um, else at 10, so I will not be on the floor for a bit. Um, <coughs> so take your cues from, um, and I will, and I will be emailing. Who's going to, or I'll be texting. Who's going to have their text? Okay. Uh, you know, um, um, to, if if something needs to happen, or if you need to tell me that something, and I, you know, I, I may be gone for 15 minutes. It may be a little longer. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I believe I'm presenting at 2:15. Oh my so, God. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. I yeah. totally forgot. Which, is, which I'm, I'm good. I'm all set. Okay. Could please, um, if, if I. Thank you for saying that, and I'm so sorry that I totally, I got a little over. Mm -hmm. All good. Um, if people can be there in case I'm not there to um, support. And um, see you when we see you. One o'clock or nothing.